He punched her in the face and she called the police. One time he hit her in the head with a chair and she called the police. But officers would come and then she found that they would turn and leave when he showed them his badge. Katrina finally moved out of their home but when she needed more clothes for her daughters, she returned to the house. Irving was waiting for her with a gun. Last week we did video on a few different cases where intimate partners attempted to murder them and they were unsuccessful. Today we're going to continue with that. I got one more story that I wanted to highlight for right now. This woman's name is Katrina Brown Lee. I am taking all of this out of one particular article. I will link it in the description like I always do. I had initially figured on doing both of these videos together, but this would have made it really long. So this is like the continued inspirational story from last week. Katrina's young life was already a series of bad relationships when she met Alex Irvin. She had a daughter when she was 14 with another boy, and she met Irvin five years later and they had a baby girl in 1990. At first, Katrina remembers him being a kind partner, but that kindness gave way to multiple different types of abuse, and she reported some of it, but officers would come and then she found that they would turn and leave when he showed them his badge because he was a prison guard at Rikers Island. Obviously, that left her feeling pretty powerless and defeated. Five years of raping, torturing, and locking me in closets, Katrina told media in an interview many years later. Where was I going to go? When you're abused and you're battered, it's normal. She had no family to turn to in New York and no other options. But at 22 years old, while pregnant with the baby that Irvin refused to have, Katrina Cook Brownlee finally moved out of their home with her two young children in January of 1993. She hid out in a nearby hotel for a few days, but when she needed more clothes for her daughters, she returned to the house. Irvin was waiting for her with a gun. Now I just wanna pause for a second as I was going through these stories about women who survived murder attempts. There was a few of them that went back to their home to get clothes for their kids. In not all of these cases, that was something, but multiple of them. And that is where having a safety plan in place is important. A safety plan which includes a go bag. I have a video on that. I will put that on the screen at the top of the screen. This is important. If you need to leave in immediate danger, then just go with whatever you have on you, even if you don't have shoes or a coat or whatever. But if you have the ability to prepare, get clothes, get food, get medications, the things that you need that are in the go bag list and have that ready, preferably somewhere else, because you don't want to go back. You do not want to need to go back. Do not go back. And if you go back, do it with police escort. Do not do it by yourself and don't do it with a family member. Oh, my sisters are going to come with me, so it's going to be okay. Police escort or nothing, okay? He was waiting for her with a gun. This is the day you die, bitch, he said, and he fired straight at her belly. He fired over and over again. In fact, he emptied the revolvers five rounds, reloaded, and emptied it again. And this article didn't say much about God. I guess she did reference him later, but Irvin's cousin happened to stop by unannounced, and he found her in that condition. He carried her to his car, drove her to the hospital, and sat her in a wheelchair out in front of the hospital and left. But he saved her life. Later that day, Irvin was arrested at his home and charged with attempted murder. The house looked like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a prosecutor later said. Doctors removed four bullets, but they had to leave six inside of her so that they wouldn't do more damage. A series of surgeries followed, and then she's quoted as saying, gallbladder, colon, and vaginal repair, bladder surgeries, partial hysterectomy, hip. When she left the hospital months later, it was in a wheelchair. She had been told she was paralyzed from the waist down and she wouldn't walk again. Her unborn baby did not survive the attack. She went to the only place she knew when she left the hospital, Irvin's mother's empty house. During the trial preparation, Irvin called her from jail. This is what you're going to say, she said he told her. You shot yourself 10 times. And as crazy as that sounded, she agreed. She was afraid that he would be released from jail at any time. How many of us have been in that situation? I have no one, she recalled thinking. He's going to get out of jail. Katrina has reported that she felt helpless, that she felt powerless on every level. 
Can you imagine being paralyzed, wheelchair bound, staying in your abuser's mother's house after he shot you over and over and over again? You lost your child. I can't imagine. While she had been helpful with building the case while she was in the hospital, that changed when she got out. She was dependent on Irvin's mother for a place to live, so Katrina refused to speak about the shooting once she got out. She also sent a letter to the judge claiming that the shooting was an accident, which she provoked. She said, I'm not coming in, and I will disappear, and you are never going to find me, the prosecuting attorney recalled. But when Irvin's mother threw her out of her house, her perspective began to change. She moved to a homeless shelter. I would go to a McDonald's and bathe, she said, me and the kids. Once I became homeless, what do I have to lose? Go ahead and kill me. What do I care? And that shift was super important. At the trial in April of 1994, that shift in her perspective was visible. So much so that Irvin pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 5 to 15 years in prison. I cannot fathom that either. 5 to 15 years. That is potentially he could get out for half of the time of the number of bullets that he put in her. And less than the number of bullets that are still lodged in her. Just, oh my gosh. But that's not where Katrina's story ends. And that's why I wanted to end with this for this little mini-series. She remembers thinking at one time, you're in a wheelchair, you're paralyzed, that's the way it's going to be. Katrina worked intensely with a physical therapist and she learned to walk again. Then she learned to run. Then in 2001, she entered the police academy. The police department had failed me, Katrina, now 51, said in a recent interview. I wanted to be a good cop, and a good cop she was, for 20 years. During her career, her 20 year career, she did her best to keep her shooting a secret. She hid the scars beneath her police uniform at first, then underneath the disguises that she wore for her undercover work, and finally, the business suit of the mayor's security detail. She talked about she was worried about being judged and she was afraid that they were going to think that because she had trauma and because the trauma had motivated her to join the police force that they were going to think she was some kind of a head case and maybe take her gun, maybe think that she wasn't capable of doing her job. So she didn't want people to know. Irvin was released from prison in 2003 after serving only 10 years for her attempted murder, one for every bullet he put in her, just in case you're counting. But Katrina didn't feel powerless anymore. In 2012, she founded a program called A Rose is Still a Rose, which eventually was renamed and designated a nonprofit, Young Ladies of Our Future. The organization, quote, aims to inspire, educate, mentor, and empower at-risk young ladies. Young women would gather for weekly workshops at one of their two different on-site facilities and they would learn everything from etiquette to bullying to gun violence to nutrition, she said. In 2013, Katrina was selected to become a member of the executive security detail surrounding the new mayor, Bill de Blasio, and his family. She worked for him for eight years. The day that she handed in her retirement papers, she had a final meeting in his office and she told him about her shooting. He reportedly looked at her in disbelief and said, you're incredible. You never showed any signs, to which she reportedly responded, you're not supposed to. And I wonder if she meant you're not supposed to because she was law enforcement, so she wasn't supposed to show that she had personal issues, like personal trauma, personal stuff that she was dealing with, or you're not supposed to tell people that you've been a victim because somehow that makes you less of a person, culturally, socially. They put them in that category of over there. It's one of them, it's not one of us, it's one of them. What might they have done to get into that situation? How broken are they? Yada yada, all the different stuff. Kind of making me wonder, what do you think? What do you think that she meant by that. As a law enforcement, you're not supposed to. I definitely have worked in jobs that you're not supposed to talk about your stuff because you're there for other people. You're there for a purpose and you're there to be the strong one. So you can't be the one with issues, even though you have issues, but you present as something else because they need somebody strong in that situation. So that could be, but I think a lot of times Victims and survivors of intimate partner violence are told they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to feel 
When I was in high school, actually, not quite the same, but still the same. I was told by a teacher one time that I was dwelling on my sexual abuse too much and that I needed to let it go and I needed to move past it. It was making people uncomfortable. Basically, it was what he was saying, that I just needed to let it go. And to me, that was, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to show that you're hurting. You're not supposed to show that you went through something. You're not supposed to show that somebody did something that was not okay. You're not supposed to show weakness. On this channel, you're supposed to. You need to. You... <sighs> A huge part of where they get their power is our silence because we're not supposed to. And the way that we're going to break that is to break that silence. You don't have to tell everybody, you tell somebody. And I can tell you, as somebody who's told a lot of people at this point, that the more people that you tell, the more that you're going to find out that you're not alone. Because when other people hear, oh, they've been through something similar to me, then they feel like it's okay for them to. And then everybody's talking. My daughter and I were talking recently about a group of females that we know and how many of them have experienced sexual abuse. She was like, it's really common. It's a lot more common than I thought. And I said, oh yeah. And then I started counting in this group and it was like 90% have experienced some type of sexual abuse, whether it be from a father, brother, boyfriend, etc. Whether it's full on rape, sexual assault, whatever. They don't have any idea how common this stuff is. They think that they're alone and they think that it's just them. The same is true with intimate partner violence, domestic violence, which sexual abuse can be a part of. People think that they're alone they think that it's just them and they think that they're so broken and that they deserve bad things because they're still there and they wouldn't if they talked to people and they found out how common it is and you would not look at these other people and think man they're pathetic these women that I've talked about today and last week, they are not pathetic in my mind at all. They are fighters. They are strong. They are courageous. I would never in a million years look at them and think that they're pathetic. But I look at myself and think that I'm pathetic for having gone through the stuff that I've been through. That is something that I have fought that stupid word for so long. But I wouldn't do it to somebody else. And the thing is that other people wouldn't probably do it to me. It's just me. And it's just you. So here you're supposed to. Whether you tell me or you tell your best friend or you you tell a teacher or you tell your mother or you tell somebody, a crisis center person, somebody at the National Domestic Violence Hotline, talk to somebody, learn the signs, talk to somebody, make a plan, get safe. You absolutely deserve to be loved and to be safe, period. Until I see you again, stay safe.